The next science understanding is about dipole-dipole interactions and what factors can influence the strength of dipole-dipole interactions. It's important to note that dipole-dipole interactions are only formed between polar molecules, or in other words, it's between molecules that have permanent dipoles. To define what a dipole-dipole interaction is, it's an attraction that results from the partially positive end of the polar molecule being attracted to the partially negative end of an adjacent polar molecule. These diagrams on the bottom show you how dipole-dipole interactions can form, but I just want to show you a specific example with uh, hydrogen chloride. So let's draw a few of uh, its molecules first. We want to show that hydrogen chloride is a polar molecule. We know that hydrogen becomes partially positively charged as it unequally shares electrons with chlorine. And remember that a dipole-dipole interaction forms when the partially negative end of one polar molecule, like this one, becomes attracted to a partially positive end of an adjacent molecule, like this hydrogen here. We can show this as such. So that's our dipole-dipole interaction. But this can also form in various areas between the other molecules surrounding it. So you can see the extent of these dipole-dipole interactions and how they can form. Uh, they can be quite extensive, and as a result, they are generally seen to be stronger than any dispersion forces between molecules of a similar mass. To look at this idea, we can compare these two molecules, fluorine and hydrogen chloride, and what we can see is that hydrogen chloride actually has a greater melting and boiling point than fluorine F2 you can see that it's n it doesn't have anything to do with its molar mass. Fluorine has a greater molar mass, just ever so slightly, so we would think it would have slightly larger or greater dispersion forces. The reason why hydrogen chloride has a greater boiling point and melting point is because it has that additional dipole-dipole interaction that it can form between its molecules. So this would then require more thermal energy to separate its molecules than fluorine. Let's now consider these two molecules. We've got H2S and H2O. Both of these consist of a group 6 atom bonded to two hydrogens. They are both V-shaped molecules. We would also know that these are both polar molecules. And one of the differences is that this molecule is bigger than water. However, if we look at comparing melting and boiling points, we can see that water, H2O, has a greater melting and boiling point even though it's got a lower mass than H2S. So the question would be, why does that actually occur? It's got to do with this next understanding, and it's got to do with hydrogen bonding. We say that hydrogen bonding is a particularly strong form of dipole-dipole interaction that can exist between molecules. And we want to focus on a few key molecules and how they exhibit hydrogen bonding. And from that point, we actually want to then look at being able to draw diagrams and explain their large boiling points in terms of hydrogen bonding. This graph shows you the boiling points of some of the group 5 to 7 compounds of hydrogen. Now, without our knowledge of hydrogen bonding, you might think that the boiling point should increase in this relatively linear fashion. However, if we do plot the um, boiling points of some of those period 2 uh, compounds, we can see that they are quite significantly high. So we've got water, HF, and NH3. So this is due to hydrogen bonding that exists between their molecules. Hydrogen bonding is the strongest type of dipole-dipole interaction and it occurs between very polar molecules. Now this can occur when hydrogen, which is a small atom, can bond to a very electronegative atom. And in particular, we're looking at hydrogen bonding to either a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. In order for hydrogen bonding to occur, we have to have this situation firstly, so a force of attraction that results from partially positive hydrogen which is bonded to one of these electronegative atoms, then being attracted to a highly electronegative atom, again being a nitrogen, oxygen or fluorine. It could be in an adjacent molecule, it could be in another location on the molecule. So going back to our example of H2S and H2O, we can see that even though water is the smaller molecule, it has the greater melting and boiling point, 
because it can exhibit hydrogen bonding. H2S can only exhibit dipole-dipole interactions between its molecules. Looking at some water molecules, what we can see firstly is the structure of a water molecule here, its V-shape, and we've also indicated the partial charges of these atoms, hydrogen being partially positive and then oxygen being partially negative. You can see this meets the requirements for hydrogen bonding because we have a hydrogen bonded to an electronegative oxygen then this itself is attracted to an electronegative oxygen in an adjacent molecule. Each of these dotted lines represents hydrogen bonding and it would be important that you can see and you can explain why these are classified as hydrogen bonds and not just dipole-dipole interactions. As part of the work that we'll do in class, we're going to look specifically at how we can draw diagrams showing partial charges and hydrogen bonding between these three molecules, so H2O, uh, HF and NH3. Before we finish, I think it's important to look at why hydrogen bonding is, is so relevant to us. And one of the ways is by looking at DNA. And what you should have learned from previous studies is that DNA is comprised of uh, a double-stranded molecule, which has this so-called double helix structure. The reason why this double helix structure forms, and the reason why we can get these two strands to, to form this double helix structure is because of hydrogen bonding. So what we've got here is a section of DNA. We've got what we call the phosphate sugar backbone. And we've got these nitrogen-containing bases, the adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. We know that certain bases like to pair up, and they pair up due to the formation of hydrogen bonds between their groups. We can see that between adenine and thymine, we get two hydrogen bonds between these groups. Whereas with guanine and cytosine, we can see that there are three of these sites for hydrogen bonding to occur. So this helps hold the, the structure of DNA together. And it's also actually what gives rise to that uh, helical shape of it. So this concludes our work on 3.2 interactions between molecules. Uh, thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time.